you all know, I think, I love old fashions. <laughs> That's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I'm going to start in a little different way. I have no disclosures. So this is um, a piece of art that was painted in 1942 by a guy who wasn't really that famous in 1942, but became more famous later on. And when I first saw it, I didn't really recognize who had painted it. I'm wondering if any of you guys know. Dolly? No. Dolly? No. 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 All very good guesses because it does look much more much in that about. style. So a clue is up here in this corner, these sort of swirls and splashes of paint. Pollock. Mm -hmm. So it's a very early Jackson Pollock painting. Pollock. And it's very different than you know the usual splashes of paint that we are used to seeing from him. And it's you know, he he just went way further off into abstractionism as he continued with his career. But this, I think, is a good example of a piece of abstract art that when you first look at it, um, it's not entirely clear what's going on. When you hear the title, which is male and female, then you begin to actually be able to see things that perhaps you weren't looking for before. And I think it's a good example of how our own prior experiences affect our perception of art and of our world around us. So this is true actually in our day-to-day -day lives. This is a picture of the New York City skyline and you can see in this um, picture up here, that's within the visual light that we all see as humans. And this is what we would see if we were standing across the river. But this is x-ray. And that's what some other species can see. Some bees can see an x-ray, some butterflies. And so their perception of our reality is very different than ours. And then over here we have gamma rays and we have radio waves, which actually no known organism can sense, except with the tools that we have built to use as human beings. And so we can see that there is even more um, part of our reality that not only can we not perceive, but no known organism can really perceive um, in and of themselves. And here, that brings me to, you know, we have um, some interesting quotes that go along the same line. So Einstein, one of the foremost scientific thought leaders of our era, said reality is merely an illusion, <coughs> albeit a very <coughs> persistent one. And in the Talmud, an ancient religious text, said the, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. And then Edgar Allan Poe, an agnostic poet, said all that we see or seen is but a dream within a dream. And so we have from the world of science, from the world of poetry, from the world of religious thought, all people who have spent some time thinking about our reality <coughs> telling us that it really is only based on our own perception. And I think we, are, we know that more and more as we know more about our minds and how the brain works. <laughs> so I know that we all think what we do is important. <laughs> but the nose is really important. <laughs> you guys. Specifically, olfaction, I think, could be really important to our understanding of our reality. So as I hope to show you, uh, our olfactory system could really be quite a good map to understanding the way that our brains work. And if we can get a good understanding of how our brains work and how we are perceiving our reality, then perhaps we actually may get a better understanding of what that reality might be. That's basically what I just said. So the reason that I think this is because, um, so this slide basically shows you uh, the number of olfactory receptor genes in all these different species. And you can see humans have close to a thousand different olfactory receptor genes. That is an incredibly large amount of genes dedicated to just smelling things. So. Just to give you some perspective, that means 5% of all of your genes, one in 20, 
of your genes is dedicated to smelling odors. To give you some perspective, that's more genes than are dedicated to our immune system. So perhaps it, it is um, a clue as to how important and primal our olfactory system is to us. What we also know is that the mechanism of, of olfaction can actually clue us into a lot of different parts of how our brain work and, and uh, parts of how our other bodily systems work. So just to bring you back to a little bit of anatomy and, and basic stuff, the way that we smell is from our olfactory receptor neurons and our olfactory epithelium. It's this two to three centimeter squared area at the top of our noses. And they get sent through the cribriform plate into our olfactory bulb. So to give you a sort of <coughs> close down look, you can see these first order neurons are bipolar neurons and they have these little cilia that sit in the mucus and they need those cilia and they need the appropriate mucus for them to work appropriately. And then they send these axons up through the cribriform. <coughs> and when they, when they are activated by an odor, what is activated is a G-protein coupled receptor. And a G-protein coupled receptor is how a whole host of different things in our body works. To give you a sense of that, about 50% of all of the current drugs that we are either using or are in production work on G-protein coupled receptors. So that's why I'm saying that understanding this mechanism can give us a better understanding of our entire system. What's really interesting about our olfactory receptor neurons is that one gene codes for one receptor. So each neuron is coded to smell or detect one particular odor. And you can see that it's really a combinatorial effect that happens of how we actually smell sense. So, you know, a rose has over a hundred different odorant molecules that gives us the scent of rose. And you can see that there's lots of different combinations that end up making us able to smell a whole host of different things people have actually estimated that we may be able to smell up to one trillion different types of odors. So going from a thousand genes to being able to smell maybe up to a trillion odors is quite a feat. This is a good example of, of how complex smell can be and how specific it can be. So this is just the sulfur-containing compounds, not all of the compounds, just the sulfur-containing compounds found in particular types of truffles. <coughs> not the chocolates, but the mushrooms. And you can see that all these little X's and minuses are the different truffles and which odors they contain. And you can see just in this range, there's a whole variation, and that's just in these small particular types of truffles. And our friend, Professor Mouzri from Switzerland, who comes to visit us, he actually did a very great uh, investigation that I probably have to repeat at some point in the United States. <laughs> so he is very interested in food, as I am. And what he decided to do was to go to all the Michelin star chefs in all of Europe, <laughs> which sounds great, and ask them to describe what they thought truffles smelled like to them. So he went all to these different places all over. He's given me these slides. So I'm gonna translate um, a bit. This three-star Michelin chef smelled the truffle and said, has a gassy, earthy, fossil-like odor incomparable to anything, exceptionally fine, and very subtle. This Michelin chef smelled the same type of truffle, and he called it a long, complex, fizzy odor, astringent, very intense, like the smell of cat urine. <laughs> That's what he thought. And then this guy thought it was primarily a garlic odor, a captivating and heady perfume, and that the taste was like garlic and parmesan. So, you know, I could go on. He had like 10 different chefs, 
and they all said completely different things about what that particular truffle smelled like. And I think that's a very good example, once again, of how our perceptions are very different from each other. And we don't always think about that because we describe things to each other with common language. And we think that that language means to each other what it means to us. But we don't actually know that. And smell is one of the best examples of how our realities could actually be vastly different from one another's based on how we perceive. There's a reason for that, and I will show you now. So going back to how the system is, is made up, you have your primary olfactory receptor neurons down here. Once they go past through the cribriform, they synapse in glomeruli in the olfactory bulb. What's interesting is that all of the same type of olfactory receptor neuron find their way to synapse in the same particular glomeruli. There's probably four in our two olfactory bulbs, so probably two on either side, that those similar olfactory receptor neurons go and synapse in. Then there are other cells that work on this whole system, and the second order neurons go up towards the olfactory cortex through the olfactory tract. You can see this pictorially very well. Um, this is a cell paper from 1998. And, and just so you have an idea about you know, the, the history of olfaction, we really only understood that um, there were these olfactory genes or anything really about this pathway in the 1980s. That's when Richard Axel and Linda Buck um, first discovered it, and they won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Um, interestingly, Linda Buck is one of only 12 women who have ever won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in history. So here is our olfactory bulb, our, our neurons moving through. Um, you can see there's a wide array, there's you know thousands of the same similar type of olfactory receptor neuron. But once they cross that cribriform, they all go to the same place. You can see that here again. This is a different type of olfactory receptor neuron that's insane, and they're all gravitating towards the same place within that bulb. So there is a pattern that's beginning to form as to where these are directed towards. Once they leave that uh, olfactory bulb, then they go up to different parts of the cortex. And the main olfactory area is called the piriform cortex. But interestingly, it also synapses, they also synapse directly in the amygdala. And as all of you know, the amygdala is this center of our brain that is you know, emotionally and uh, very linked to our primal, instinctual flight or fright, flight response, uh, our desire, things like that. So here you can see that again in a, in a nice illustration where here's the uh, olfactory bulb, and they stained one particular type of uh, second order neuron, and they see that they actually form synapses to a, a wide variety of areas, and I'm going to talk about the cortical amygdala here and the piriform here. You can see that in the amygdala, and there are lots of other illustrations that show this, but this is just one basic one, the pattern continues those particular types of olfactory neurons that have gotten a single signal from a particular glomerulus within the olfactory bulb move onward and synapse in just one particular place in the amygdala. And that's probably why when you smell something, you can have that immediate emotional trigger of what that takes you back to. It's either something that's frightening or something that's exciting or a deep nostalgia that's probably where that instinctual feeling comes from. There's a patient that I actually saw who uh, was in the military and had PTSD, and every single time he smelled smoke, or TNT in particular, he immediately became extremely afraid, and he became an agoraphobe. He couldn't leave his house. He couldn't walk around outside, because whenever he happened to smell that smell, he would be sent into a panic attack. So smell can really trigger quite powerful emotional responses. Interestingly, <coughs> if you look at the piriform cortex, there is no mapping. It just disappears. 
So all those neurons that were carefully going from one spot to the other spot and staying with each other now have this vast array, the seemingly random array of where they go synapse in our cortex. And it's not just those neurons that randomly synapse in different parts, but if you look at the specific um, different types of olfactory receptor neurons, they are, you know, in the opposite frame, they are going to parts that are the same of the cortex. So a particular um, smell of rain versus a dog versus a pizza may all be synapsing in the same area of your cortex. And this really probably shows us how, again, just like how our own experiences affect the way that we see abstract art, and our own experiences affect the way that we smell things like truffles, <clears throat> our own experiences are dictating what we think or feel when we smell these smells, because they're going to particular parts of our brain, all these different varying smells, and my piriform cortex probably looks very different than all of your piriform cortexes as far as what is synapsing where. So that's kind of a basic synopsis of the last 40 years of olfactory research <laughs> as far as basic science and what we know about the structure of the olfactory system. But of course, we're clinicians, and so what I really care deeply about is how to help patients who have a problem with this system. And so I'm going to start with what causes us to lose our sense of smell and taste, since 80% of our taste is related to smell. So you all know, probably, the primary reasons why people tend to lose their sense of smell. This has sort of been very well studied and described multiple times. This kind of shows them um, multiple uh, series where they showed that, you know, overall, sinus and nasal inflammatory disease is the leading cause of olfactory dysfunction. And then a post-infectious problem, and then idiopathic, are kind of tied for the next two most common. And then trauma is obviously up there also. But really, there are over 100 different reasons why people can lose their sense of smell. So there is metabolic issues, endocrine issues, toxins in our environment, medications, all sorts of things that can make people lose their sense of smell. So when I first started getting interested in this at Emory, I decided to just try and look for a few things that I thought could possibly be playing a role. One of the studies I did was looking at influenza vaccination rate. So we know that lots of different viruses can cause a post-infectious olfactory loss. And we actually know from some good animal studies that the influenza virus in particular is pretty virulent and um, causes great damage when introduced into the olfactory epithelium. And so I wanted to know if people had or had not been vaccinated in the year prior to when they developed their loss, did that make a difference? And we did see that patients um, who were not vaccinated versus patients who were vaccinated in the group with olfactory dysfunction was quite significantly different. So 81% of our patient group in our post-infectious and idiopathic olfactory loss group had not been vaccinated against the influenza virus. And so um, that was a significant finding. And then something else that I had sort of learned about through reading through basic science was that something else that really affects the way that we um, you know, think about uh, how smell affects our behavior is that animal models show fasting increases and satiation decreases olfactory acuity. And so we know that this is actually mediated by this hormone. It's a pretty popular in the media hormone, so you've probably heard of it, <coughs> adiponectin. Lots of people in the weight loss industry are really excited about adiponectin. That's inversely correlated with body fat, and it's found to enhance responsiveness of olfactory neurons. This makes sense, evolutionarily speaking. You can imagine if we're starving and we're trying to find food, if we can smell it, it's gonna help us out. And so, Again, I evaluated 60 patients, this time from all different etiologies of smell loss, and I wanted to see, just looking at their BMI, was there any particular difference? 
And we did see a difference. We found that um, here, I know this is really small and you probably can't read it in the back, but normal in the olfactory dysfunction group, and remember this is in Atlanta, so there's a lot of obesity, <laughs> it's just a baseline. But normal weight plus underweight patients made up 20% of our olfactory dysfunction group versus our overweight and obese patients <coughs> making up 80% of that group. And that's versus in our control group, 60% of our patients were overweight and obese. And that was a significant finding. Now the problem, obviously, with studies like these is that I could just pick one of those hundred different possible etiologies out of the air and look at all my olfactory patients over and over, but it, it's impossible to control for all those confounding factors, right? We, we're not asking people every single time about all those hundred possible etiologies of smell loss whenever we're putting them into a study like this. And so it's very difficult to know really what this type of study um, finding means. So how do we go about diagnosing this and treating this a little bit more scientifically? Um, and how do we figure out why people have it? So there's different methods of testing. Um, the ones that probably you guys are most familiar with are the objective tests. Sniff and sticks is the um, one of the only tests that tests for all three parts of olfaction. So threshold, identification, and discrimination. And the one that we use most commonly in the United States is the UPSID. Some people have tried to use the BSA, which is a brief version. It only has 12 instead of 40 because it takes a long time for patients to get through 40. Uh, and in a busy clinical practice, it does take up a little bit of time. But we've shown that um, the brief UPSID is really just a screening tool, and it's not going to really give you that very much information for your loss. So there's lots of other types of tests that you can do, but the point is there are ways in which you can objectively test someone's smell. Now, there are also subjective ways of testing smell, and this is a little bit more controversial because right now um, we know that objective smell loss and subjective smell loss do not correlate. And so right now, if you try to submit a paper, as some of us know, with uh, just subjective findings of olfactory loss, they'll say, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't correlate at all with objective smell loss. But I think that we should push back against that idea, because if you think about other things we treat, for example, take chronic sinusitis, for a very long time, we just depended on nasal endoscopy or CT scan as our findings to prove sinusitis. But what we now know is that a SNOT-22, a quality of life survey, is actually very important in finding out how our patients are doing, if they're progressing or getting better. And we do also know that the SNOT-22 does not correlate with either the CT or the endoscopy. And so just because something doesn't correlate doesn't necessarily mean that it's not important information. And it probably is the most important information as far as the patient is concerned. So how to, about, how to go about doing the workup? There, you know, is, there are a million questions you could ask a patient with olfactory loss. But these are kind of the highlights that if you're seeing a patient in your clinic with olfactory dysfunction, these are the types of things that you want to know. You want to know the duration, if it happens suddenly or gradually, if their taste is intact or not, if it's complete or partial, all these other history symptoms. So cyanonasal, endocrine, autoimmune, prior surgery, if they've been exposed to anything at work, if they started a new medication, if they've had chemo or radiation for any other purpose. And then of course you want to do your full head and neck exam and nasal endoscopy and a cranial nerve exam because obviously something that can affect cranial nerve one could also affect other cranial nerves. So like I said, you should do an objective test. I use the opposite, but you can choose whichever you prefer. And then imaging, whether or not you choose to get a CT or MRI really depends on the patient's history. If you, you know, are thinking it's a cyanonasal inflammatory history, a CT is more appropriate. If you're thinking that there's a big mass up there, obviously you should get an MRI. The mini mental status exam can be important because we know now that olfactory loss can be one of the first signs of neurodegenerative diseases. And so if you start to get a sense from the patient that there may be more going on than just olfactory loss, if they seem to be having uh, more memory problems or 
seem to be having a little bit more difficulty than their age group of peers, that might be something that you want to do and then send them on to a neurologist. Labs, there's a lot of different labs you can choose to do, um, again, depending on what their history suggests. But kind of a basic panel that you can think of, there are particular vitamin deficiencies that tend to cause olfactory dysfunction. For example, vitamin B deficiencies, vitamin A deficiencies, thyroid hormone being low is um, a possible cause. Uh, and so those are sort of things that you can think of in general if, you're, if you have an idiopathic patient on your hands. And then of course the history can direct you if you should be getting an autoimmune panel, if they have other autoimmune symptoms, or if you should be looking at liver function tests, things like that. So once it's occurred and we've evaluated it appropriately and hopefully we figured out why they have it, what can we do? Well, if it's cyanasal disease, then it's pretty simple what you do about it. You treat the cyanasal disease. So if it's something like this, where they're you know full of, this, this person has allergic fungal sinusitis, you can see their eyes being pushed out of their head. And so if there's so much in there that their eyes being pushed towards the side of their head, obviously no air is getting to the olfactory cleft up here. So it's an obstructive phenomenon, probably also an inflammatory phenomenon of why the nerves are not functioning as well. And that's why when you have a polyp patient and you remove the polyps, Sometimes you can improve their smell, but if they've had that chronic inflammation for a very long period of time, sometimes it can diminish over time and not come back as well every time you remove those polyps. This is a case I did yesterday. So this is another reason, a very rare reason, but um, a reason to look for as to why patients might have olfactory loss. So anesthesia neuroblastoma, a tumor of the olfactory nerve itself. You can see it's going straight through the curviform plate up into the intracranial cavity there. And I'm just showing you the video because why not show you guys a video as part of this stuff. So here's the tumor you can see. We're just delineating um, our anterior boundary. It's going through septum. We want to make sure that we are doing an oncologic resection because it's a cancer and you want to make sure that no matter how you resect it, endoscopic or open, that you're getting around the entire thing. So on bilateral sides, we're just taking the tumor up, and then we're get, again delineating what our margins are before. There's a lot of post-obstructive secretions within the sinuses that the tumor had been blocking, and this is just us removing that. This is now performing a draft three so that we make sure that when we reconstruct that entire skull base that has a defect in it, we're not gonna block off our frontal sinus. Now you can see delicately dissecting those intracranial vessels off of the tumor and bringing it out. Here is Krista Gali being gently prodded out of the uh, middle of that tear mass. And then as we bring it down um, further uh, back, we can see, again, vessels over the tumor. And after we get it out and have the entire area clear, we put some Surgicel to help scar that area and allow our fascia lata and our medcore cortex plates that we're using as a gasket seal to heal well over that area. Now you can see half that septum was involved with tumor, so you can't use that, right? Usually we use a nasoceptal flap to reconstruct that area, but what you can do is a pedicle nasal floor graft, and that's what we decided to do. So just a little surgical video for you in the middle of all that olfaction talk. <laughs> so there are things that we can do for some people, but that obviously is not gonna bring that person's smell back. It's gone. But there are some things that we can do to help people bring their smell back, potentially, if they have a loss of smell from these other um, more vague reasons, post-infectious, post-traumatic, idiopathic. So currently right now, the things that have good evidence, olfactory training, steroids, and potentially others that we're looking into. So alpha lipoic acid, and some of these Possible medication therapies are probably going to sound familiar to our otologists because people try to use a lot of the same stuff for tinnitus. And so um, there was a lot of excitement um, when this article first came out about lipoic acid being able to treat post infectious patients with smell loss. It was unblinded and it was uncontrolled. And at first, they concluded they had significant improvement. But over time, Professor Hummel, who's one of the big names in olfaction, backed away from that conclusion. And 
he sort of said, you know, I don't use alpha lipoic acid. I don't actually think it helps my patients. And so he doesn't recommend anyone using that. Zinc is another thing that people got really excited about. I didn't try to put any of the <laughs> articles up for zinc because there's so many articles, whether it's oral or intranasal or different formulations. Um, there's ionic zinc. So the jury's really out. They have all competing conclusions. The one thing that we do know is that intranasal uh, introduction of zinc is really bad for your olfactory system and it can um, be of great detriment and cause a permanent smell loss. So you should never have your patients using a zinc nasal spray. But zinc by mouth, lots of different conclusions. And right now, I don't recommend it because some studies have actually shown a decrease in their olfactory ability. Theophylline is another thing that people got excited about. Um, even here, we were excited about theophylline for a little while. Um, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And as I talked about before, we have a G-protein coupled receptor that when activated, um, activates cyclic AMP and phosphodiesterase basically blocks the breakdown of that cyclic AMP. And so we think, well, if we have more cyclic AMP around, perhaps we'll be able to potentiate that neuronal signaling and maybe that's why it will work. There was this open label controlled trial of in treatment of patients with hyposmia. It was a cohort study. They used an oral theophylline and they did find some minimal subjective improvement, um, and there is no control group. So take what you can from that study. The main problem is that, as probably all of you know, oral theophylline has a whole host of side effects. We used to use it all the time for kids with asthma, and then we realized that it has great potential for cardiotoxicity, and the therapeutic range is extremely small. And so people don't really use this very much anymore. So then someone got the idea, well, if we can't give it orally, if it's so tightly, you know, hard to control tightly, why, why don't we give it intranasally? Dr. Hankin's the one that um, decides to do this. He has a smell center in Washington, D.C. And he did a pilot study of 10 patients who had failed oral theophylline in the past. The measures that he used in the study are not validated. None of, neither the subjective nor the objective measures that he used to grade this are, are validated at all. So that's another grain of salt to take with this. But he did show that with oral theophylline, 14% of patients improved, and then intranasal theophylline, 28% of patients improved. Remember, that's out of 10 patients. So, uh, you know. We have 14 and 28 out of 10 patients. The, so the 14 was the, the cohort before he took the failures from the oral theophylline group and then put them into the intranasal group. So really what prevents me from um, trying this in patients, because maybe if you know there's no bad side effect and we're not hurting people, maybe we should try it. But then I saw this animal study, which actually showed that you could decreased um, electrophotogram amplitude with using the offline directly on the olfactory epithelium. So it is possible that we could be harming patients by trying this with them, and so we stopped doing it. So this was a cohort study in 2004, and there was basically systemic oral steroids <laughs> tried, a taper over 21 days. Um, it was also um, compared with mimetazone spray, but there was no control group of nothing but they did find a significant improvement with oral steroids in this group. There's been a couple other studies, and I'm not gonna go into um, big details, but I'll just show you in this one where they were interested in knowing if steroids or ginkgo biloba <coughs> might help people. Um, they put all the patients on mometazone and then um, had the prednisone group alone or prednisone plus ginkgo biloba, <coughs> and there was no significant improvement with the addition of ginkgo biloba, but there was improvement of oral prednisolone spray in the, the post-viral olfactory loss group. Um, so again, something showing that steroids can help. And then this is an animal study basically showing that if you sever a nerve, like my, what might happen in a traumatic injury that causes olfactory loss, and you directly inject dexamethasone into that area early, um, perhaps uh, it could be helpful in restoring olfaction. The injury-associated tissue had a much faster and greater resolution of the olfactory system compared to controls. What about omega-3? So there have been lots of different articles um, and lots of different uh, 
basic science and clinical journals showing a wide array of neurologic disorders gaining benefit from omega-3. Uh, and so now it is actually prescribed um, quite frequently by neurologists, by primary care doctors, for a whole host of different things as preventative therapies or trying to treat um, when people have a nerve injury, those types of things. And so it's possible that because this is a nerve system that we're talking about, that omega-3 could help. Um, we're currently performing a randomized controlled trial. I was doing it at Emory, and now we finally have approval to bring it here to Stanford and run a multi-institutional study. Basically looking at our post-operative pituitary patients, we know that about 20% of our endoscopic skull-based patients have some form of olfactory loss. We don't actually know what our specific rate of loss. This is just a percentage that's out there in the literature. So by doing this study, we'll, we'll learn two things. We'll learn what our specific rate of loss is, and we'll also learn if randomizing patients to omega-3 directly postoperatively, if we can change that rate at all. So olfactory training. How, how many people have heard of olfactory training? I know the residents have probably heard me talk about it at this point, but how many of the others of you? So olfactory training is actually the the thing with the highest level of evidence that we have to offer patients right now with olfactory loss. It's very simple. It's just a simple smelling structured protocol. And you basically start with at least four different odors. We start with these, rose lemon, eucalyptus, and clove because they activate different categories of olfactory receptor neurons. And then, pretty simple, they just smell it, not a long time, 15 seconds each. And then they rotate through it, they do it twice a day. <laughs> several weeks, so I have my patients do this for six months, because as more and more studies come out with longer and longer term durations of olfactory training, every time you extend it, a higher percentage of patients will improve. So I have my patients try it for six months and then come back to see me. So what's the rationale for doing that? Well, we do know that the olfactory <coughs> nerves are unique and all the other cranial nerves and that they do have the inherent ability to regenerate. Probably our olfactory nerves are regenerating all the time throughout life. And when we get an insult that's so great that we cannot regenerate anymore, we're trying to stimulate those basal cells in the olfactory epithelium to regenerate new <coughs> olfactory receptor neurons. We also know that the <coughs> cortex, that part of the brain that um, those, those second-order neurons go in synapse to, um, does have neuroplasticity. We can see changes in it over time. And if you introduce new smells to a patient, the, that area will change. And so we know that that also has the ability to change. So there have actually been quite a lot of studies um, looking at olfactory training from all sorts of different etiologies, even two Parkinson's disease patient uh, studies, and two randomized control trials. This is the first one, just to sort of show you where we started. And it showed that 30% of patients, and again, they're using sniff and sticks, which looks at all three um, types. 30% of their patients with olfactory training had improvement. And then that study was followed by a whole lot of other prospective studies. This was a randomized controlled trial using very standardized concentrations of odorants in their patients and trying to use a control group. It's very difficult to use a control group in olfactory training because you're doing it over a long period of time, and if you give something to a patient and their mom or their brother or their spouse smells it and it's obviously not smelling like anything, they tell them and then that ruins your control. So what they tried to do was use such a low odorant uh, group that most people would not be able to smell it, and they told the patients that they both have odorants, um, but, but one's lower than the other. And in the high odorant group, 63% of patients improved versus 19% in the low odorant group. There's a systematic review then performed of all these prospective studies and the randomized controlled trial, and they concluded that it may be beneficial. So I saw all of that, and I thought, that's great. I really want to use this in my patients. But you know, research protocols don't always translate very well to clinical practice, and it would be very expensive to try and give patients standardized concentrations of odorants and give that same exact amount to every single patient that you saw and refresh them every so often. And so the other thing about um, the study is almost all of them use sniff and sticks, and that is a test that takes a really long time to perform. I went to Dresden and visited 
Professor Hummel's clinic, he only has small patients all day long, and he only sees like 10 patients a day. <laughs> and they sit there and do lots of studies and, and get lots of things done, but that's not really very feasible for a visuolaryngology practice. So after I thought of that, I decided, well, I'm going to do my own randomized control trial. I'm going to use the opposite as my smell test because I don't have the time in my clinic to do synthesis. And there have actually been studies showing that you can correlate opposite uh, results with SIF and 6 results. Discrimination and identification correlate very well together. And if you suspected that threshold is off, you could just do a simple butanol test or an alcohol pad test, that kind of thing. So I used the same exclusion criteria as the other one. And basically, I randomized them to either having no factory training or not. We did lots of um, things to try and keep them on it, like journal entries and calling them. And I just told them, go out and get this scent of essential oil. It doesn't, it could be any brand, it could be any concentration, it could be any cost. I basically wanted it to be a real world study to see if that would work if I asked patients to do that. And we did actually see similar results. So 32% of our patients in the olfactory training group had improvement um, versus 13% in the control. And this is the, using the same sort of um, cutoff as that other randomized control trial and many other olfactory training trials use. That's why we use that over 20% of patients in the group having improvement as a primary endpoint. Other things that we found, which were not surprising, was that there's a correlation between age and change in their upset score. So the older you are, the less likely you are able to have a larger improvement in your upset. And also, the duration of your smell loss will affect your ability to recover. And that makes sense, right? Because as we know in any neurologic system, if you don't use it, you lose it. So The really kind of exciting part about olfactory training, to me at least, <laughs> is that there's this study, which only uses seven patients, but it's a functional MR study, and I think it's really interesting. They had patients go through olfactory training for 12 weeks. They did the um, basic smell tests, but then they also did this functional MRI, and they took patients before the olfactory training. They had this disparate, chaotic sort of array of connections throughout their cortex, and after the 12 weeks of training, all of those synapses were back where they were supposed to be in the entorhinal piriform cortex. So I think it does show that we are doing something real to the brain. We're changing the pathways in the brain with, by doing this olfactory training. So then after I figured out, you know, we can actually maybe do something to help patients, we wanted to see, you know, well, are patients actually being sent to us to get help? And so we just finished this study. We just submitted this to uh, COSM. Uh, if a conch isn't here, she did a lot of work for it. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, so she found 851 cases um, from 1990 to 2016 just within our system. And we wanted to see, as patients entered the Stanford system with this primary diagnosis of olfactory dysfunction, who did they see? And then who did they see after that? And what was their outcome? So. About 52% of patients first saw a non-ENT provider for their smell loss. And 70% of patients were never referred on past that first provider. So we did see that patients with no referral were 61% less likely to improve compared to those who were referred to an ENT. And then patients who were referred to a non-ENT provider as their second person were 63% less likely to improve also. 80% of all patients saw no improvement over the entire referral period. 74% of patients were not even offered any sort of treatment for their small loss. And then what we saw was that patients who were offered treatment of any kind were 4.2-fold more likely to improve over the entire course of their referral pattern. And if they were offered treatment at their first referral, they had a 6.3-fold greater chance of improvement. So I think that this shows that it does matter who patients see and if those providers know what treatment to offer them. So what I'm trying to uh, move towards uh, is something that's quite interesting to me, and I've been working with the ophthalmology department and the physics department, and um, I've been doing a lot of rat handling workshops and things like that since I have no basic science background. We're 
prepped and almost ready to go for a study, basically doing a proof of concept study to see if neurostimulation or neuromodulation can change uh, olfactory recovery after damage to the epithelium. We're using a rat model and um, you know, there's lots of things that go into this that are, are different than how people study olfaction right now. For example, most patients, when they, or most scientists, when they study olfaction in an animal model, they do an ex vivo study. They do something to the animal, and then they kill it, and then they open up the olfactory epithelium and, and pass something over and see what the EOG looks like. But we're going to do a study where we keep the animal alive and record field recording off of the olfactory bulb and see what that shows us so that we can actually um, see change over time in a uh, possible recovery phase. We're also building an olfactometer, um, which there are uh, other ones out there, but this one is going to be uh, specially uh, formulated for this particular type of study. So there's a lot of stuff in the works, and hopefully this is going to be something exciting. So it all comes back to our patients. And just to remind you, uh, of why we should care about our patients who have this problem. Mortality in anosmics is 3.81 times more likely than in normosmics. And in these surveys that are taken of these patients, it's pretty sad. 50% are angry, 40%, 7% are isolated, 40% are depressed. And that is what I see um, when I see these patients in clinic. It really does have quite a great effect on, on patients and their social interactions. And I think that really you can take that all the way back to where I started with our realities are shaped by the way that we perceive our environments and having this huge loss of your ability to perceive your environment and interact with other people um, really affects your quality of life.